the following in-depth interviews continue the dialogue started with Green Fire, our Emmy award-winning film on the life and legacy of Aldo Leopold. We are pleased and honored to share more wisdom from our thinking community in Voices of Green Fire. Agriculture, Food, and Community. We're not very knowledgeable about our food system today and the nutritional value to food. Uh, so I think uh, that is at the very uh, basis of community development. You know, when people, land, and community are as one, all members prosper. When regarded as competing agents, all suffer. Mutual support. I, I just I can't think of a better definition of community than mutual support of the soil, the water, the air, the plants, the animals, the humans, the families of humans, the cities and towns, all are really all one community. The earth is a community, perhaps even the universe. In this community of Fuller Park, I'll give you an example, you talk about a food desert, uh, we're beyond food desert. We don't have a store in this community. To buy food, we have to go to someone else's community. And so four years ago, we said, you know, enough is enough. We're going to start growing our own food again. I think, uh, I know, not just think, but I know that uh, we're not just growing food. We're really growing community, too, as we grow our food, because food is the most powerful thing in our lives. Whether we realize every day we wake up, the first thing we think about, what are we going to eat today? What are we going to pack for lunch? Uh, what are we going to have for dinner? Whether we go out to dinner, you know, or whether we, wherever we eat, it's always on our mind. It's what keeps us alive. <laughs> so, um, but it's the last thing on most people's agenda when we start think, talking about uh, community development, um, or anything, it's like, let's fix the streets, let's, uh, uh, you know, fix the crime, let's fix all these other things. Uh, but I think we need to start with, with the food. If we have a solid food, food system, then uh, other things are much, become much easier. America has spent a couple of centuries building a hyper-individualist society. Uh, a society where we're encouraged to think of ourselves all as units of one, you know. Um, and that's not an ecological idea. It's not a theological idea. Uh, and it turns out it's not a sustainable idea. Um, and so this drive to rediscover community and figure out how to make it work again is very, very key. And, and we happily begin to see examples of it springing up again. Local food networks, the farmer's market is the fastest growing part of the food economy in this country, for instance. Well, we get more and more people here every year talking about where their food comes from and, uh, and they, they really care. Um, the, the certified organic label is not as important to people as it is to talk directly with people. And I did have somebody today tell me, asked me today, he said, well, is it grass-fed? And I said, yes. And he says, well, it is organic, although that doesn't mean that it's necessarily grass-fed, does it? And I said, it certainly does not mean that. So, so it's best to be able to talk to somebody who raised your feed rather than uh, just read the label. Makes it better, more enhances the, uh, the whole idea of understanding where your food's coming from. One of Leopold's greatest contributions was to understand but communicate that community is much broader than the way people had traditionally thought of community. Community is not just a group of people who live together, it's also our relationships to the natural world and our understanding of how we affect it, depend upon it, how it affects us. That sense of community is really at the core of the land ethic concept, the earth ethic concept, the sea ethic concept. Community is very intimate. 
but it's also very encompassing. And that therein lies the challenge. And I tell folks sometimes is that I am a former Sierra Club activist who's now a dues-paying member of the New Mexico Cattle Growers Association. And in that short little sentence is a, a long journey uh, and, a, and a pretty exciting journey from thinking about landscapes a certain way to thinking about landscapes another way today. And so I used to think of landscapes in, in more of a protection, conservation kind of model. Now I think about them as you know, in a, kind of a working landscape with food and land health and things all kind of integrated restoration as, as, as part of what we do. I think you're gonna see actually more and more blending or blurring of that line between conservation and agriculture. I, th I think a lot of the energy today is at this nexus of eco and ag agriculture. Uh, you know, you're hearing a lot of terms these days for eco, ago, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I, I, and frankly, there's, there's, there's tremendous amounts of progress being made at blending the ecological knowledge with the agricultural knowledge in ways that we start to be able to manage these landscapes for questions like climate change. You know, how are we going to sequester carbon? How are we going to restore these landscapes? Um, the old environmental paradigms were effective for certain kinds of conservation activities. Agriculture had its limits. I think you're seeing in this blending in between agriculture and, and environmentalism a, a lot more sort of creative, innovative thinking about how to actually address things like restoring degraded watersheds. I mean, I'm not saying every watershed in the American West now has a bottom-up citizen-based sort of initiative to conserve its watershed, but there's a whole lot more of them than what existed 10, 15, 20 years ago. And, and now it's probably, I would be almost more surprised to go into a prominent watershed in the American West and not find, you know, a watershed-based group, a citizen-based group, a bottom-up group trying to do good things for the watershed in which they live. Well, I think urban agriculture is the hottest thing going right now in agriculture, not only just here in the U.S., but worldwide. Because uh, for practical uh, reasons, uh, there are more people living inside cities uh, today around the world than living in rural areas for the first time. Uh, they say by 2050, 80 percent of the world's population will be living in cities. Uh, so it's really a practical reason that uh, we have to start thinking about how do we feed people um, with less land. As we sit here and talk, we're losing agricultural land and we're still losing our rural farmers. I used to go to my grandmother's house, whether I liked it or not, at least three or four times a year. Most people these days, if they have a grandmother, they don't have a grandmother on the land or a grandpa, and they don't have that. Um, shack experience where you you go as a family and you work and you play and you learn together as it is here Sid's kids are um, somewhat older than mine and they're all agriculturally oriented mine are all city kids so when they come we spend a lot of time trying to understand the relationships between why we're cutting brush and cutting firewood and splitting firewood and stacking brush and if we're lucky, maybe we'll get to burn, and that's always exciting, but, um, and what part the animals play, that you don't go out and pot shot all the rabbits because rabbits are a food source for a predator, and our coyotes and mountain lions, and you know, we, we don't hunt turkeys because they have a very important part to play in getting rid of the, the uh, crickets, the grasshoppers in the summer and fluffing up the pine needles in the fall so that if we have the opportunity to burn, the resource is ready. I first became aware of you, not personally, but through, through this newspaper article they quoted you talking about the African-American experience and, and the connection to land that had been lost and how that you're concerned about reclaiming that connection and understanding how important that was. How, where, did that, where did that come from well, in your life? That came from a 10-year-old boy being sent down south on a train to spend the summer with his great-grandmother, who was a sharecropper in the late 50s in Arkansas. And so she would teach me in the mornings, very early, how to pick cotton. 
okay? And then in, on the side of the house, she had a little trunk garden that she would grow the food that we would eat during the day. And so when I saw how sustainable my grandmother was and how she was able to feed not only me, but also a lot of her other family with her farm that she had on the side of the house, and she was able to provide housing as being a sharecropper for some bigger farmer, it struck me that when that great migration from the south came up here and everyone was coming up for the jobs in the factories, we actually abandoned a lot of the skills that we had learned working the land. And it became a negative connotation to even work a farm or have a garden in your, your yard because so many African Americans was like, listen, man, that's slave work. I don't do that anymore. But, and so there was a disconnect. When I left the farm at 18, like many farm kids, I said, never again will I do this work. <laughs> well. And here I, you should never say never. That's one of the lessons I learned and that I can pass on to my kids or, and every, all the kids I work with. You never say never because uh, once I got out of college, I played professional basketball and wound up my last years in Belgium and uh, I found myself uh, hanging out with some Belgian farmers because I had time on my hands. I would go out in the countryside and, and all of a sudden I had this urge. So I must have had this hidden passion that I didn't know I had. And all of a sudden I wanted to grow food again. Something was missing in my life and that was it. My mother came from a very humble, and my dad from very humble farming backgrounds. And so they really were not inclined to garden. They'd hoed up enough cotton and whatnot. They really didn't want to get involved. So time-wise and all, I didn't grow up around gardens or land specifically. But it's one of the, you know, sometimes there's something in you that wants to be part of it. So I'd always wanted to have a garden. But when you have five kids and you're moving around a lot, you don't have a lot of discretionary income for mineral and supplemental inputs to try and make a really rotten piece of dirt produce them in a short amount of time. So when we came to Rudoso and I promised my daughters that we wouldn't leave till they were out of high school, I thought, ah, maybe at this point now I'll get to do something. I was trained in the natural sciences very early on and thought they had all the answers uh, to managing the land and that cultural answers uh, to how we manage the land that had been rooted in communities for centuries were probably imperfect. Now I see that um, a natural science that complements that traditional land-based knowledge is what we need. It's not one way of knowing the land or the other. It's how we bring those uh, uh, together. Coexistence has got to be our, our goal here. We've all got to share this landscape. Um, whether it's predators and cattle, it's people and wildlife, it's urban and rural, we've all got to figure out how to kind of link arms here to deal with the various conservation challenges that are starting to really kind of press down on us. And, um, and you know, and again, there are examples from around the world that, that we ought to be looking at. And there are, we don't have to reinvent these wheels. And, and why it works in one place and doesn't work in another place is probably more cultural, political, and historical than biological or ecological. The land ethic is based on the concept of community, that it can't be individuals just taking care of a single private piece of land. It cannot just be a national park, but it has to be a community of farmers, ranchers, urban dwellers that create corridors of stewardship that link individual properties and protected areas, or the whole thing will fail. I think the one thing that we've learned over the last 50 years is that it's not enough to have a single visionary land steward make a difference in wildlife habitat, that wildlife always ranges beyond the boundaries of a single park or private parcel of land, and that unless we have an ethic that is shared within a community and practiced by all community members, we never get the benefits of a land ethic made manifest in the landscape. And when I said that 
you know, one of the mission goals that we have at Eaton Place is to reconnect people to the land. You know, it's about survival for us today. We've got to get back to basics. We really have to get back to basics so that we can have something to leave our grandchildren. For more information and videos, visit the Green Fire page at humansandnature.org and the Aldo Leopold Foundation YouTube channel. Footage created through a partnership of the Center for Humans and Nature, the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and the United States Forest Service.